What a joy it is to be speaking to you via this medium of radio. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to share this thought that God has laid on my heart for this week. I'll give you the cliff note version right now before we jump into anything further. This is going to be a week of encouragement. That's the goal. That's the thrust. That's where I believe God has led us. I'd love for us to sign off at the conclusion of Friday's broadcast here on the Bible Attract Echoes radio program. And I don't wish for you to say that Micah McCurry, the host, myself, that that man was an encouragement to you. No, my prayer is that you look at God's word and you look up towards heaven and you realize the good God that we serve and the joy that it is to be a part of his family. And on that note, I'd love for you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. While you turn there, I'd like if you'd allow me to highlight a certain gospel track that we've been using at the Bible Tracks Incorporated Ministry for many years. It's called A Good Soldier But Lost. Again, that title is A Good Soldier But Lost, and you can find that on our website, BibleTracksInc.org. It retells the story of a man named Captain Cornelius. He was a Roman soldier. The Bible describes him as a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This sounds like a great guy, but here's the problem with Cornelius. He did not know what his eternal destiny held. If he died and passed away in the middle of our account from the book of Acts chapter 10, then he would have slipped off into eternity an unsaved man. But this gospel track, A Good Soldier But Lost, retells the story of how Cornelius came to know Jesus Christ was the only and eternal savior of mankind. I'd encourage you to visit BibleTracksInc.org so that you can get this gospel track for free. Of course, our ministry has been printing and producing gospel tracks such as this for free for over 80 years. We'd love for you to take part in this if the Lord leads you in that direction. 1 Samuel chapter number 30. 1 Samuel 30, if you'll find your place there, I'll reiterate once again how much I appreciate your investment of time in this broadcast. And I do hope if you're not able to turn in your Bible or maybe open up your favorite Bible app on your smartphone, that you would listen with intention as I read the first six verses of 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse number one. Listen closely if you would. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep, and David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. I'll repeat that phrase before we finish that last verse. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Of course, the David that we are speaking of here in these verses, in this account, is King David. And at this point, he was not yet given the kingship. The kingdom was not yet his. He was still on the outs with the predecessor of his kingdom, King Saul. And David here is faced with a situation where the Amalekites, the sworn enemies of the Jewish people, came to his, at the time, hometown, Ziklag, burned it with fire, and took everyone that had been left behind, the women and children, they took them captive. Now, understand, if you would, that David had followers, a band of mighty men, 
people that were very loyal to him, that trusted David to the nth degree, and they come back to what their really is their base of operations at this time. And I'm sure as they're walking towards the city, they begin to get a scent in their nostrils. And these men of war, these trained soldiers, many of them, saw in the distance what looked to be a fire, the effects of fire, the smoke rising to the sky. And I'm sure they began to hasten their steps. They began to run. And as they got closer, a sense of dread welled up inside of them. And very quickly, their worst fears were realized. What happened? The Amalekites had come. These terrors, these people who wanted nothing but the worst for the people of God had come and taken all of the young ones, all of their wives, all of those that could not defend themselves had been taken away, and David was greatly distressed. As we look around us at our world, at what is going on all around us, both personally, professionally, and then on the world stage, at times it becomes easy to become distressed. But our desire this week is to present a week of, if we can call it this, encouragement. Learning from this particular Bible account, this true story of what God did through the life of David. Another title that we could give this is, What to Do When Distress Seems to Conquer You. What to do when the distress seems to be overwhelming. You'll remember, and you'll forgive me for mentioning once again, the subtitle of our COVID-19 track, the track that God led me to write about a year ago now. The subtitle is this, Overwhelmed. And it was inspired, that particular title, of course, I believe in part by the Lord's leading, but really because I sensed that the world and the people of the world were becoming overwhelmed. What do you do? When you're in a place when all you can do is put your head down and keep going. When what you really want to do is curl into a ball and shut everything out and everyone out and just let the distress and feelings of being overwhelmed wash over you. Well, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but we can do what David did. He encouraged himself in the Lord. But let me give you a small anecdote, an illustration that might help us with this. A few years ago, in the mountains of West Virginia, a young boy was traveling with his mother during uh, the winter time. And of course, as you know, the days become a little shorter. It gets darker early, earlier in the evening. And if I recall correctly, he had been picked up from school by his mother. And they were driving on what would normally not be treacherous mountain roads, but that bane of the driver's existence, black ice, seemed to cause the car to side slip just a little bit. Now, I've driven through the mountains of West Virginia, and I've seen a car in front of me begin to slide back and forth, and actually, but by the grace of God, it could have been much worse. They ended up side-swiping me in that occasion, and thankfully, by the Lord's grace, again, we uh, remained safe. There were no damages beyond what happened to the car. Uh, Myself and the other occupants of that vehicle were fine. That happened actually close to a year ago, towards the beginning of evangelism. So I can commiserate and I can identify with this young mother picking up her young son, all of seven or eight years old from school, not realizing that the temperatures had dipped just enough that this mountainous road had become slick. And as they were driving home there, the car begins to slide as they come around a curve. And very quickly, it hits the gravel on the side of the road, and that's not enough purchase, not enough grip. They slide just far enough off that it tumbles off the side of a small ravine, only 15 feet or so, but it felt like an eternity as the car began to slip, slide, and then roll over once and ended up on its roof at the bottom of that small dip. Well, here's the problem. The mom had bashed her head against the window, broken it out, and certainly had at least a concussion, but she had been knocked out cold. The boy had his seatbelt on as he should have and was jostled, but thankfully, once he kind of got his bearings, realized he was upside down, 
and started calling for his mom, as any young boy or young girl would in that circumstance, and got no response. He took a moment to get his bearings, really figure out what's going on, unhooked his seatbelt and fell to the roof of the car because they were on the top side of the car and scrambled up as well as he could to the front seat to figure out what was going on with his mom. Of course, as you know, head wounds bleed more freely than others do. It can seem more traumatic than it actually is, and the young man was shocked to see blood dripping from his mother's hair. He needed to get her to safety quickly. With every ounce of that he thought he had, he unhooked his mother and, and tried to cradle and, and get her to the ground, which again was the roof of the car, and using the broken window as an exit, dragged his mom outside of the vehicle. As I mentioned, it was close to the winter time. There wasn't snow on the ground, but the temperature was certainly dipping. It was evening time, and because of the ravine there, having no guardrails and being lower than the road up above, cars driving by would not be able to see what had happened. If someone didn't somehow stop by happenstance, by coincidence call it, there would be no way for them to be helped. The little boy, with every fiber of his being, began to drag his mother up the hill. He knew she needed help. Maybe he could have clambered up the hill himself and waved a car down, but he wasn't quite thinking clearly, and his immediate thought was, Mom needs help, and he began to clamber up that hill with mother in tow. Remembering that little child's proverb, the tank engine that could, what did it say? I think I can, I think I can. I think I can. And just as he was about to quit, that came back to him in a rush. And he thought, I think I can. I think I can. And he crested that small hill saying, I know I can. I know I can. Not long after, a car came by and saw them there, the mother prostrate on the ground, still had not woken up. And thankfully, there was no long-lasting damage. And the boy was hailed as a hero. My question for you. As you may just be, some of our listeners may be going through one of the worst times of their life. What are you going to do when you're greatly distressed? That's the discussion for this week. A week of encouragement. May the Lord let it be. Have a great day for His glory. Make sure to join us as we continue this topic tomorrow. God bless. Have a great day.